Good morning again. Uh, it's good to be back with you after a couple of months of long service leave. Uh, and let me uh, again add my welcome to our visitors today. It's wonderful to have lots of visitors, and especially those of you joining us for the celebration of Micah's baptism, which is a, a great joy for the church. And uh, we look forward to uh, celebrating some more with some food at the end of the service. So do stay and join us then. Now, for those of you who haven't met me, uh, my name is Charlie Fletcher, and I'm the vicar or the senior minister here at All Saints Clayton. Uh, I should ask, actually, as I get going today, are there any uh, Sydney Swans or Brisbane Lions supporters in the room this morning? Yes, you can tell them by the ear-to-ear -ear grins on their faces, can't you? Uh, are there any Port Adelaide or Geelong supporters with us this morning? They couldn't get out of bed this morning. Very sad. Yeah, I'm very sorry. But you know, if, if that's you and you're feeling that you're suffering unjustly this weekend, I have some good news about unjust suffering for you in this morning's sermon, so hang in there. Now, for my first sermon uh, back after long service leave, I have made a strategic error, a big mistake, huge, because today's reading is maybe the most obscure passage in the whole Bible. I really should have got someone to preach on that while I was away. Mistake. What does it mean when Peter writes that Jesus went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah? What is that about? Well, we'll get to that. On the plus side, the passage does mention baptism, which is appropriate for today's service. Now, Catherine and I have only been back in the country for a week. We arrived from Greece last Sunday morning. So if my explanation of this tricky passage is hard to follow, join me and blame the jet lag. But actually, we can do something better than that. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we look at one of the more obscure parts of the Bible, we come with faith-seeking understanding and we ask, please help us to see why you have put this passage in the scriptures for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Catherine and I finished our long service leave with a study tour uh, following in the footsteps of the Apostles Paul and John, uh, visiting biblical sites in both Greece and Turkey, and of course, staying on a couple of Greek islands along the way. One of the islands we visited was Patmos. It's not the most famous touristy island in Greece, but you may have heard of it. It's a lovely little island, actually, with lots of nice uh, hotels and restaurants and shops, delightful streets and plazas to meander through and explore. A couple of thousand years ago, though, in New Testament times, Patmos wasn't a holiday destination, but a place to be sent into exile. The most famous place on Patmos is this cave. It doesn't look very much like a cave, does it? Because a Greek Orthodox church has kind of been built onto it. But this is the site where tradition holds that the Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, while he was in exile on the island of Patmos. Uh, he writes about being on Patmos in the first verses of the book of Revelation. And that book is directed to Christians facing pressure and persecution, urging them to keep trusting in Jesus and keep bearing witness to him. Well, the Apostle Peter, the author of our reading this morning, also wrote to Christians under pressure and facing the prospect of unjust suffering for their faith. Perhaps not organised persecution, but pressure and the possibility of suffering. Well, like John, Peter encouraged them by pointing them to Jesus. And the encouragement is for 
us too today, as we face pressure to compromise our faith in different ways in order to fit in with the society around us, to conform to it. The opening word of our passage, for, uh, as Peter writes, for Christ also suffered once for sins, tells us that Peter is developing an argument. And so we need to pan out a little bit to see the context of today's verses. He writes that it's better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. And we're going to ask why. At the beginning of last week's reading, if you were here, you might remember Peter asked, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? In general, if you're doing ostensible good, especially if you're trying to do good to others, that will win favour with people. And there's plenty of overlap between what Christians believe is good and what the rest of society thinks is good. For example, caring for the poor. For a striking example, in the 4th century AD, a Roman emperor by the name of Julian the Apostate, he didn't like Christians very much. He wanted to wipe out Christianity. But he had a problem and he grumbled. He said, it is disgraceful that while the impious Galileans, that was his way of talking about Christians, while they care not only for their own poor, but for a house as well, Everyone sees that our people lack aid from us. What was his problem? How can I get rid of the Christians when everybody can see that they live better lives than we do? So Peter asks, who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? Of course, not everything Christians consider good is embraced by the rest of society. So if we challenge the sexual ethics of our day, or if we insist on the Bible's message calling people to repent and to put their trust in Jesus to be saved, that can lead to tension, to pressure, even to suffering for your Christian faith. But Peter says, even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. And he goes on to say in the words just before today's reading, for it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. And we might ask, why? Why is it better? Why is it blessed? Well, today's reading, today's tricky reading, gives an answer to that question. And the answer is found in the story of Jesus, the story of his death and resurrection and ascension. Now, if you're visiting today, and particularly if you're uh, not yet a Christian, if you're perhaps someone exploring Christian faith or just joining us today for our celebration, let me encourage you to pay attention to that very first sentence highlighted in yellow, because it takes us right to the heart of Christianity. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. What is Peter saying? In ourselves, we are not righteous. We are not in right relationship with the God who made us. In fact, the Bible's stark news is that in ourselves what we deserve is to be excluded from relationship with God. By contrast, Peter says Christ, Jesus, is righteous, completely righteous. The Bible says that he's God's son, but also the only human being who's ever lived in perfect relationship with God the Father. And yet... Peter writes that he suffered. He suffered for sins, 
the righteous for the unrighteous to bring us to God. That is, Peter saying Jesus suffered what we deserve in our place so that we could enjoy a relationship with God that we don't deserve. He suffered once because once was enough to save us. Look around you. It's a nice full church this morning. There are lots of Christians in the room. Not one of them earned their relationship with God. Because you can't earn it. It is a costly gift offered through faith on the basis of Jesus' suffering. But Peter doesn't stop at Jesus' suffering. Did you notice the trajectory of Jesus' story that Peter describes? Notice the other phrases highlighted in yellow. Christ suffered, that is, he was put to death in the body, describing his death when he was crucified on the cross. But there's more. After that, he was made alive in the spirit, a way of describing how after his death, he was raised to life again. And then even more, at the end of our reading, he says that Jesus has now gone into heaven and is at God's right hand. Death, resurrection, ascension. And that trajectory gives us some clues for understanding that very tricky bit in the middle about going and preaching to imprisoned spirits. There's lots of questions about those verses and literally hundreds of different interpretations, uh, but uh, I won't cruel you by going through them all. We have some lunch to enjoy after the service, so we can't go that long. We'd be here for a week. But if you're wondering what it's about, looking for some answers, let me offer very briefly a couple of suggestions about what those verses are saying. Uh, you can see Peter looks back to the story of Noah uh, and the ark. It's a story you read in Genesis chapter 6. You might know it. It's a story about how God saw the wickedness of human beings and decided in his judgment to send a great flood to wipe out the human race and to start again with his creation. But how in doing that, he saved a few people, Noah and his family. When Noah built the ark and Noah and his family, eight people were rescued from the flood by being safe in the ark. Uh, and if you know the story, along with them, lots of pairs of cute and tasty animals as well. And that's for another day. Just before the story about Noah and the flood in Genesis 6, there's this mysterious account that talks about the sons of God going and marrying the daughters of men. And later Jewish tradition identifies the, the sons of God in that story as fallen angels. And that's probably the background to what Peter's talking about here. That is, he's saying, when you think about the trajectory of his death, then his resurrection, and then his ascension, going back to the Father, the gist of what Peter seems to be saying is that Jesus, after he had risen from the dead, went and preached, presumably preached the news of his saving death and his victory over death and over unjust suffering and over all evil and declared it to the fallen angels and the evil spirits that await God's final judgment. All right. That's where you get on the tricky passage today. Feeling overwhelmed? Flooded, maybe? Let's come back to the main point of what Peter's trying to do. What's, what's his message for us? Why is he pointing us back to the story of Noah and to this ancient Jewish tradition? What was he trying to say to his readers and what is he trying to say to us today? Peter wants us to find our story in Jesus' story, writing to Christians 
under pressure for their faith, pressure to abandon or compromise their faith, and facing the prospect of unfair, unjust suffering because of their faith, Peter encourages them, he encourages us, to find our story in Jesus' story. He tells us that the unjust suffering that Jesus endured was not in vain. In fact, it achieved our salvation. And it ended. It ended in the victory of Jesus over unjust suffering and evil and over death itself. The victory of Jesus who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand, ruling over everything and everyone with angels and authorities and powers, Peter writes, in submission to him. So Peter says, then, if we suffer unjustly on account of our faith in Jesus, our suffering is not somehow outside God's will for us or outside God's control. Jesus rules over everything. Our suffering, like Jesus' suffering, will not be in vain. God will use it for his good purposes. And, like the suffering of Jesus, our suffering will end. And it will end, Peter says, in sharing the vindication of Jesus in heaven. That's why it is blessed. Such a strange way to talk about suffering, isn't it? But we can talk about it that way when we find our story in the story of Jesus. Do any of you recognise this face? face of a very famous Christian from uh, last century. Have you heard of Richard Wormbrand? He was the author of a book called Tortured for Christ, and he founded an organisation called Voice of the Martyrs, uh, trying to uh, raise awareness and support for persecuted Christians. Well, during the Soviet era, Richard Wormbrand spent 14 years in prison uh, in communist Romania for refusing to deny his Christian faith or keep it quiet. And yet, this is what he wrote. Listen to his words. The communists believe that happiness comes from material satisfaction. But alone in my cell, cold, hungry and in rags, I danced for joy every night. Sometimes I was so filled with joy that I felt I would burst if I did not give it expression. I remembered the words of Jesus. Blessed are you when men come to hate you, when they exclude you from their company and reproach you and cast out your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and Leap for joy. Why joy? Because as Peter encourages us, Richard Wormbrand found his story in the story of Jesus. At the end of our reading, you might have noticed, through the imagery of water, Peter makes a connection between the story of Noah and the flood and Christian baptism, which we celebrated this morning. He talks about the flood and then he says, this water symbolises baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The story of Noah and the flood displayed God's judgment on a wicked world, but also his saving of a few. In the Bible's story, that flood points forward to the final judgment to come at the end of history. And as one writer, Karen Jobes, puts it, Peter's readers will be among those who escape the second flood of judgment 
because they have already passed through the waters of Christian baptism, which saves them by virtue of the vindicating resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is, they have nothing to be afraid of at the final judgment because they are safe in Jesus and in his resurrection. Peter says it's not the water of baptism that saves us, but the resurrection of Jesus. It's not the ritual washing of baptism that saves us. It's being joined by faith to Jesus. In baptism, like Micah today, we are identified with Jesus, joined to him in his story of suffering and glory, patiently enduring present suffering as we look forward to coming glory. And Peter says, baptism also brings with it a moral imperative. He describes it as the pledge of a clear conscience towards God, reflected in the commitments that Deepak and Esther and Sonny and Cynthia made this morning as they spoke on Micah's behalf. It's a commitment to a life lived in light of the relationship that we have with God through Jesus, especially when there's pressure to live otherwise. Well, today we baptise Micah and his sponsors have spoken on his behalf and pledged to bring him up in the Christian faith and to model it for him. But Peter's words are an encouragement and an exhortation for all of us. You will face pressure in your life. You might be facing great pressure at the moment, if you are a Christian, to conform to the world around you, to conform in what you believe and in how you live. Micah will face pressure to conform to the world around him. Peter says, it is better, it is blessed, to live as a disciple of Christ and shine as a light in the world. God bless you.